ahead in India, it's time we identify and introspect on its genesis and re-energize efforts to counter it. News X's senior editor Madhudas Gopalakrishnan spoke to Rajiv Malhotra, the author of Breaking India, who decodes for us the forces which work from within and outside to break our unity. Listen in to this exclusive interview. We're joined right now by Renaud author Rajiv Malhotra. Uh, let's begin by asking him about his latest book. Your latest book, uh, Mr. Malhotra, talks about scholars like Wendy Doniga, you know, who are Indologists who talk about India, write about India. You've been very critical of them and the way they observe India and, uh, you know, their sort of analysis. Uh, why do you, uh, what is your premise really that you're trying to argue in your book? You know, they have a freedom of speech, which I respect, and so do we. So they criticize our culture in a very serious way. I call it Hindu phobia. They, they knock down our deities in a very obscene way, sometimes vulgar way. Our gurus, our lineages, symbols, history, all of that. Kind of demolishing, debunking, which the British used to do, which the Christian missionaries still do. Uh, so it's become a hobby. Hindu phobia is sort of a fashion. So I think it's time to respond. Respond intellectually, uh, not uh, trying to stop them but giving our point of view so that people get both sides and then they can decide. Right now, the dominant distribution of knowledge in mainstream media and many other places has been the anti-Hindu, the Hindu phobic view, because historically it's been uh, punching back. Hinduism are a soft, Hindus are a soft target. And so I'm trying to level the playing field. Also, I mean, could you give us specific examples that you've argued, you know, because in terms of what Wendy Donica has said that has either offended sensibilities and what your counter has been to some of uh, uh, her arguments, can you give us a couple of quick yes. examples? So, Wendy Donica uses a theory called Freudian psychoanalysis, which was meant to analyze human beings, but not for deities and symbols and, you know, but she do uses it for analyzing the goddess, uh, you know, the uh, Shiva, uh, Ganesh. So, for instance, she considers her, she and her school of thought have considered Ganesha's trunk as a limp phallus. So worshipping is a worship of a limp phallus. Now obviously, uh, people who've just done worship in a, a Ganesh temple, if you were to survey them uh, when they come out, have you been worshipping a limp phallus, they'd be pretty offended. But, but this sort of thing wins book awards. Uh, this is in a, in a very prestigious university, and these books are taught all over, even in India. These books are taught. You find them in airport shops, and it's fashionable for Indians to say we're very cool. So this kind of approach is too, ma too mainstream and not uh, sufficiently criticized, and I'm just trying to level the playing field by balancing it out. Right. You've also spoken a lot about Islamization and its effect on India. How do you read the current situation in Kashmir, particularly the manner in which protests, you know, have uh, been taking place? Do you look at it as a clear sign of external influences that are affecting India, uh, you know, post-independence, uh, uh, you know, close to 70 years after that as well? The signs of that continue to remain. Pakistan as a state actively involved in that? Yes. I think the external influences are both uh, Islamic, and uh, Christian evangelism and conversion, as well as the leftist, Maoist, Marxist uh, influences. So we have three, three ideologies competing for world market share. All of them are in India, and I call that the Breaking India Forces, because they are funded, their nexuses are overseas, and they have enough sepoys, I call them, intellectual sepoys in this country. The old sepoys were working for the British, and now the new ones are working for these forces. And so these are Indian intellectuals, these are NGOs, these are various kinds of uh, uh, public intellectuals that are aligned with these kind of forces. And uh, so Kashmir is, a, is an advanced stage. It's a disease can have many stages. Many other parts of the country have similar diseases but not as advanced. And they're heading there. I mean, Northeast has its own problems. So it's not only Kashmir. The Kashmir syndrome has sort of metastasized. The cancer has spread. And so you'll find similar things elsewhere. So the, but before violence starts, before separatism becomes violent, there is an intellectual separatism. People are told that you're, you are poor or you are suffering because, you know, you are really, India has harmed you. So in you versus India. A group is told that you are not part of India and India has harmed you. Or North-South, or Dalits are told that, or gender divide. So the divisiveness of the narrative of India is very, very central in this whole Western study of India, and it's been the case. The counter which will be the counter narrative which will unify, which will show what's combined, what's unifying us, is, has not been given as much support. So it's become fashionable to divide 
and uh, mock at the uni unity of our nation, uh, call it saffron and stuff like that. But actually, it has nothing to do with modern politics. It has nothing to do with any political party today. It's a very these are very ancient unities that we need to respect. Kashmir used to be the land of Shiva, the land of Kashmir Shaivism, a huge place where Buddhism was very strong. So if you look at the history, the pre-Islamic era, it was a, it was a fantastic uh, part of our Indian civilization. So gradually, this has been Islamized, first very peacefully, and then gradually now very violently. So this is a sad story, but uh, we've seen it coming, and we haven't done enough to control it. The Article 370 officially kind of makes it a separate place, in a sense, double standards. The same rules don't apply, and we legally, in that, because of that, do not consider them to be fully Indian. And this is, I think, uh, uh, a wrong message to be sending. So what needs to be done? I think this 370 should go. In fact, we should rehabilitate, settle large numbers of people there. We should, there should be no segregation of uh, Kashmiris versus non-Kashmiris. I mean, that's really a recipe for disaster. It will take courage, but we should do it. I mean, we are doing so many other things that uh, not doing it is more risky than doing it. It's just that if you do it, it's a short-term risk. You have to overcome that. If you don't do it, longer term, you're falling, slipping down in a bigger risky situation. You, in your concept of breaking India, you know, do you think that applies, you know, to those who are sort of glorifying terrorists such as Burhan Wani who are gunned down by Indian security forces. I mean, he's a person who's also taken on many uh, of our martyrs have given their lives, uh, security forces have given their lives because of terrorists like Burhan Wani. Mm -hmm. So how do you look at this sort of uh, tendency among a small section to sort of try and uh, eulogize such sort of people? I think it's not just a small section. I think uh, there is a small section that's very open about it. But you know, the Indian left has come, become the umbrella to unify all the breaking India forces. So the Islamic, uh, the, you know, forces that are trying to, in an extreme way, break up, or Christian forces, or Marxists, or, uh, you know, various other elements, Maoists, the left tries to put them all together into a coalition. I call it Hindu phobia, because what they're against is what unifies them. If you look at the rest of the world, uh, there is an Islam versus Christianity war going on in the rest of the world. But here they have a common enemy, so they're united. If you look in the United States, the left versus right is actually the right is Christian. Hindu phobia brings them together. So actually this Hindu phobia is a very important uh, co construct to understand because it is what unifies all these breaking India forces against a common enemy. No, but uh, in terms of actually eulogizing people who are terrorists, you know, yes. that is something that uh, how can anyone who is a part of India, whose own country and motherland is defended by these forces, you know, people who are acting against the interest of our security forces, how can they be eulogized? Do you find that, uh, you know, something that is completely yes. at this See, I live in the United States, and uh, there, uh, if such a person exercised this freedom of speech, they would be allowed to legally, but it, they will not get the support of so many intellectuals. They will be kind of sidelined. People will think that this is very wrong. Uh, and, and the respect for armed forces in the U.S. is huge. The armed forces are very powerful, larger than life. People respect them. Heroes come back from war, and the whole village, the whole town is parading in their honor. I don't see that much respect for our armed forces in India. Armed forces are underappreciated in, in India. And this is a very bad thing because they're really the ones who are risking their lives for the sake of the nation. So we should be actually honoring those guys rather than the people who are dissenting and fighting against them. Today, for instance, we had a politician in parliament in the Rajya Sabha refer to POK as Azad Kashmir. You know, this is a member of the Samajwadi Party, you know, a senior member called Nadesh Agarwal, you know, on the floor of the House of the Rajya Sabha. So when you have that kind of a situation where you are actually have your mainstream politicians inside the temple of democracy talking about, talking the kind of language of separatists. So, you know, do you find that extremely yeah. alarming as well? POK, POK India should actually not be silent on it, but should be very actively demanding it back. It should be very actively. And not only that, India should be demanding the separation of uh, Baluchistan. Because Baluchistan was not part of Pakistan when the, uh, when the British left. Baluchistan was annexed by Pakistan later. I mean, people don't even know that. But Baluchistan was independent uh, at, in, on the August 14, 15, uh, 1947, when Pakistan gained its independence. There was no Baluchistan part of it. They annexed it later. So we have a, and there is a strong Baluchi separatist movement. They're looking for help. We haven't helped them. So we should actually be more aggressive rather than being on the defensive. As far as these uh, politicians 
and some media people also. Arundhati Roy champions these kind of people also. So there's lots of intellectuals who do that. You know, it, it's interesting that the mainstream actually sucks up to them. We just really think that they are cool or they they have. We give them their right, which we should, but we look up to them. We honor them way too much. Nobody, I think, in the U.S. Uh, you know, Senate or Congress would make a similar remark, uh, you know, eulogizing or praising somebody who's a terrorist or a or, or real enemy of the state. Nobody would do that. I mean, they would, the, the voters would kick them out. And so I'm just very shocked and surprised at the uh, low kind of self-esteem that some of our leaders have. Right. As Indians, very low self-esteem. Right. All right, meanwhile, the ITV group...